Campbell Stevenson, and I'm thrilled to be the host of this new program, Her Story. Women's history has been a big part of my life and has been inspiring me uh, through the years. I've learned from these tremendous women who have broken through barriers and obstacles, who've come before us, and I would love to share those stories with you so we can learn together and be inspired about how we can really educate and help everybody understand that women's stories are important and that they are a part of our history and we need to be bringing her story to history to tell our story because we are all together in this. I'm the cultural ambassador to the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. Each episode will feature amazing Maryland women who have really led the way here in, in our state. Our featured woman today is Ellen Saubre. So please stay with us. We'll have a great show. We'll be right back. consider this quite an honor. Yeah, it is, and you're joining some tremendous company, as you know. I am aware of that. Yeah. That's rather awesome. It is. I know. It's very overwhelming almost, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit what you think in your life led you into these endeavors that you've been in that have caused you to be such an achiever? Well, I had parents who were very encouraging, and they created quite a competitive spirit in me at a very young age. Um, but I really expected to be a high school biology teacher, and I had a true life-changing life experience. My husband is a first-generation American. His parents are both, uh, were both born in Germany, and at that time, Germany was divided by a wall, East and West Germany. And as young marrieds, we took a trip, um, spent a summer in Germany on both sides of the wall. And I have to say, I, it was the first time that freedom ever much occurred to me. What does that really mean? That was a strong message. But when I, when I had the opportunity to see how differently people behaved mm -hmm. and how prosperous people living in freedom uh, were versus people living under an oppressive communist government, the behavior of the people was so dramatically different, the ability to accumulate capital. It, it had such an impact on me that I came home for the first time got involved in political activity and it went from there. And you never, <laughs> and you never left it once you began. It's an incurable disease. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have anyone in your life that you consider a role model or a mentor to you? Well, my certainly from a role model perspective, uh, I adore Ronald Reagan. Uh, he stood for the whole concepts of limited government and individual liberty that I believe in so strongly. My mother was a great and first mentor. Um, in my third career in the State Department, uh, one of the first people that I worked with was Jean, was Jean Kirkpatrick. Uh, and I had just such a wonderful experience with her and looked up to her. And of course, Condi Rice uh, is my final yes. mentor. It's a long legacy. Do you have any thoughts that of what you've done that you feel most proud of? Um, I feel very proud from the political perspective that when I ran for governor, we almost doubled the number of Republicans in this legislature. And I feel very strongly about the need for a two-party system, which Maryland uh, does not have um, very much of. So I was proud of that. I was proud of being the first woman uh, that almost got elected. And, um, but the things that I'm most proud of came from my final career in the State Department. I had the opportunity to break a 20-year log jam uh, as a strong diplomat in getting the 
two countries of Nepal and Bhutan to work together and it's release 50,000 uh, Bhutanese refugees that have been living in a prison in, in a uh, refugee camp for 20 years. I also had the opportunity to convince the government of Jordan to educate Iraqi refugee children, which were at that time not allowed to go to go to school. And getting no education. Getting at all. no education, some of them for the third year, and you know children without an education for three years, that's their future. Um, so those those two things as I look back, I, I'm especially proud of very proud of being yeah, able can to see why achieve. Now are there any personal comments you'd like to make as part of your legacy to the young people coming up now, what would you say to them and advise them or any personal thoughts you have? I think it's really important to have a big dream, a big idea, a big thing that you, that you believe in passionately that, that keeps you motivated and excited. And I think you follow that dream where it takes you. You don't let people tell you you can't do it. Never let someone tell you you can't do something. That happened to me in my very early uh, political endeavors. And, uh, and I, I was told I, as a woman I couldn't win a legislative seat. And I did not let that stop me. And I won that legislative seat. Um, but I think that, that, I also think that, that women need to be risk takers more than they're willing to be. If I hadn't taken a risk and run for governor, which didn't work out. And what year was that? That was in 1994. And I gave up a very safe legislative seat in the process. But if I hadn't taken that risk, I would never have ended up doing the thing that was the most satisfying and gratifying of my life, which was the work that I did in the, in the Department of State internationally. That's a great example of taking the road that seems the less taken, and yet it leads to the one that you're most proud of. I've and always found it to be true that God closes a door and opens a window, and you just have to be ready when that window opens to see the, feel the breeze and, and see the, the path to yeah. whatever. Well, that's wonderful to have that vision. Thank you again, and we so much appreciate your thoughts. Are there any last thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, to young women, act like a lady and work like a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll keep that message. <laughs> Welcome back. Wasn't that inspiring? Now let's go to inside the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame. I am excited to have all of you here this evening. Thank you for coming. At this time, I will invite Secretary Ted Dollar to the podium to give the welcome on behalf of the Department of Human Resources and present the Maryland Women's History Month Proclamation. Secretary Ted Dollar. Thank you, Diane, for that very nice introduction. I'm happy to be here today with so many remarkable Marylanders who have dedicated themselves to improving the lives of others. In addition to the honorees, I'd like to take a brief moment to recognize Secretary Gloria Wall, fellow member of the Governor's Cabinet, privilege to serve with her. I'm also happy to see many members of the Women's Legislative Caucus here tonight. As you know, the General Assembly is tackling its fair share of controversial issues this year. Uh, many long days and nights. Um, by the way, there are 18 days left in the session, not that any of us are counting. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Senators uh, Barbara Mikulski and Ben Cardin for their continued support and uh, of, the women, of the Maryland's Commission for Women that is housed in DHR, and also recognize Congressman Harris for in his attendance tonight. <laughs> we hold the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame induction ceremony each March as a way of celebrating Women's, women's History Month. We do it to recognize the important role that women have played and the key contributions <coughs> they have made in helping others in Maryland and across the nation. And the women that are being honored here tonight did, did what they did not out of a desire for recognition, but for a shared desire to strengthen the economic, political, and social standing of women in Maryland. Thank you to all the honorees for their dedication and accomplishment. All of us, whether we're women, men, boys, girls, are better off because of what you did. So I'd like to read a loud round of applause for tonight's honorees. I'm also going to present a proclamation from Governor Martin O'Malley to Pat Cornish, but rather 
have it back here. But rather than read the whole thing from start to finish, um, I'm going to read the one part that I think is particularly apropos for the honorees tonight. So you know how these things go. There's whereas, and they go through all these things. So, so whereas, it is appropriate to celebrate Maryland women and girls for the distinguished record of historic accomplishments renowned throughout the United States and the world. I know all of us agree that not only the six honorees here tonight are perfect additions to the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame, but also would be perfect additions to the United States Women's Hall of Fame. And I don't know if there is one for a World Women's Hall of Fame, but I think they'd probably be good candidates for that. Your impact has reached far beyond the state of Maryland, and uh, we thank you again for your contributions, and I congratulate you. I hope you enjoy it very special. Senator Barbara Mikulski. Molly, will you please stand? Thank you for being here. <laughs> and Joyce Levitin, who is the assistant to Senator Ben Cardin. Good evening. <clears throat> On behalf of Senator Mikulski, I want to thank you all for letting me share this evening with you. Um, she does send her regrets. She wishes she could be here, but due to her schedule in Washington, she was unable to make it up from the Hill. She does send a few words, though. Dear friends, greeting to the members and guests of the Maryland Commission for Women on the occasion of your annual Women's Hall of Fame induction ceremony in celebration of Women's History Month. I am delighted to join you today to recognize and honor your six distinguished honorees who have achieved much in their personal lives, but have also contributed much to their communities and county. I know that they will treasure this moment much like I did for my induction those many years ago. Friends, recently I assumed a big privilege and great responsibility as the chairwoman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. And in this recent election, we shattered another glass ceiling in the Senate, adding five new women for a total of 20 women senators. Women leading does make a big difference because we know it's, more, it's about more than gender, it's about having an agenda. So now I invite you all to join with me. It's time to suit up again. Put on your lipstick, square your shoulders, and continue the fight where we need it. Come join the revolution. Sincerely, Barbara A. McCallsky, United States. Senator Cardin also is sorry he can't be here tonight. They're voting on the budget, and we don't know how long they're going to be in D.C. Um, but I'm very proud to be here and to have these citations to present on his behalf to these six outstanding women. Throughout his career, first in the Maryland House of Delegates, then as a speaker, and 20 years in Congress, and now as a United States Senator, Senator Cardin has championed equal protection under the law for women. His work to elevate the needs of women and families with a focus on health care, financial security, education and job training, and the protection of a woman's fundamental rights of privacy and reproductive freedom. And he is so excited to serve with Senator Mikulski. And Marilyn is very lucky to have her now in her new position as chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, this past year, he was a proud co-sponsor of the Paycheck Fairness Act and the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. And he was extremely glad to see the passage of the bill he had sponsored to create a National Historic Park on the Eastern Shore in honor of Harriet Ross Tubman. conductor of the Underground Railroad. Um, there, as part of this legislation, there is also a park in Auburn, New York. And when Senator Hillary Clinton was in the Senate, she was a leader in um, introducing that legislation. Um, the groundbreaking on the Eastern Shore took place just a couple weekends ago. Mm -hmm. And speaking of groundbreaking, Senator Cardin is so proud to be serving this 113th con Congress with the record number of 20 women senators. That's great, but it's not enough. But we're on our way. Alan Salabray is a distinguished member of this, former member of the state legislature and ambassador to the UN Commission on the Status of Women. And as many of you know, she came very close to being the first governor of Maryland. <laughs> governor here in Maryland, they will absolutely owe a great debt of gratitude to both Ambassador Salbray and Congresswoman Bentley. I'd like to call our next presenter, Delegate Kathy Shaleka. She's going to introduce Ellen Salbray. Good 
evening. Um, I'm Delegate Kathy Schlegan. Any of the ladies in leadership that are here, if you'd like to join us up here with Sue, please feel free to make your way up here. Um, sorry, this is kind of short. Um, it's not for tall people. Um, the Honorable, there she is, the Honorable Ambassador Ellen Salabray. Ellen rose up through the grassroots political world running campaigns. She decided to run for office, challenging the male-dominated political establishment. She won. Delegate Ellen Salaway was the, oh, the first woman elected to be the minority leader of the Republican caucus in the House of Delegates. She served well as a leader there and grew the minority representation in the House. <coughs> Ellen. She was uh, not the first woman on the ballot, thank you, Helen Bentley, <laughs> um, but she was our Republican gubernatorial candidate twice for governor. Though not successful, many like-minded candidates were elected because of Ellen's hard work. After that, Ellen Saraway went off to run a $1 billion census project for the federal government. George Bush, President George Bush, Bush nominated Ellen to represent the United States internationally because Ellen was smart, thoughtful, and hardworking. In 2002, Ellen Salabray was appointed as an ambassador to be the U.S. representative to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. In this post, Ambassador Salabray focused mostly on the needs for more education for women and the importance of empowering women economically and politically. These are things that Ellen Salabray still works on today. January 2006, Ambassador Salabray was appointed by President Bush as the Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration, where she worked directly under Condoleezza Rice, our Secretary of State. Ellen's accomplishments with refugees led to numerous awards and international recognition. What has Ellen Salabray meant to those of us who know her today? While achieving worldwide recognition for her work with refugees and women, Ellen remains a humble and gracious friend to many. Ellen's phone is always on. Ellen's kitchen table is always open. Ellen can be counted on for guidance and support from her many years of public service. Ellen Salabray, role model, true leader, smart, gracious, helpful, and loving wife of Will back there. Hey, Will. <laughs> Mentor, great advice based on experience from simple to complex still working hard for the Republican Party. Friend, a beautiful smile, and a hug always. Thoughtful and considerate, a true friend. These are the ladies in leadership. There are 12 ladies Republicans elected in the House of Delegates today, led by Delegate Sue Allman. And our nickname for Ellen, which sums it up best of all, is uh, not Honorable Ambassador Ellen Salabray, but Ellen Salabray, our fairy godmother. Thank you to this wonderful group of ladies in leadership, the, uh, the people trying to hold up the Republican banner in Annapolis. I really appreciate your nomination to this position. And Kathy, especially, I know how hard you worked uh, to put this together. And Sue Alden, whose husband, Carl, uh, came to work for me when I was running a campaign in 1976 for Larry Hogan for governor. And Carl was 12 years old, <laughs> and he was my first opportunity to really mentor someone who went on to become the Secretary of State of Maryland. So the 
Commission on the Status of Women, oh, the, excuse me, I'm in the wrong pew here. <laughs> the Women Commission for Women and for this honor. I, it, it is really such a special opportunity and, and, and occasion uh, to be with the distinguished women here on the front row, but also to be in the company of people like Harriet Tubman and uh, 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 I remember seeing that uh, Claire Barton, I think, was one of your nominees in the past. Uh, it, it is really quite special. And to a lot of friends that are here, people that have helped me over the years, I want to say a special thank you. None of us get anywhere unless we have the shoulders of others to stand on. And to my husband, Will, who has had a lot of uh, unwashed socks and cold meals because I've been running off doing something else that's always been a supporter of whatever it is I've, I've tried to do. Thank you very much. You know, as I thought about this, you realize that you never know where your life is going to take you. And I think back and I, I've often said to others, I think I led three lives. I started out as a science teacher in Baltimore County, and then a politician, and finally a diplomat. But I can tell you that there is nothing that prepares you for anything like being a teacher. And just out of curiosity, how many people in this room at one time were teachers? Look at that. If you can stand in front of the classes, as I did at that time, of 40 kids, high school science students and, and, and teach. You're ready to take one, I think, just about anything. Um, I have often been asked also by friends and, and, and you know, fellow associates, how on earth do you go from being a, a biology teacher in, in Towson to uh, having the opportunities that I've been so blessed to have? And when I think of some of the really special opportunities recently, it was to be negotiating with the government of Jordan that was not allowing Iraqi refugee girls to be educated. Mm -hmm. And some of those girls had been out of school for three years by that time. And to convince the government of Jordan to allow these girls to go to school and then to go over there and go to a school uh, where an Iraqi girl and a Jordanian girl were standing together and they were best friends. That was really special. To be in countries as varied as Mongolia, uh, the Ivory Coast, Moldova, teaching women how to run for political office. What a great, great opportunity. And working with the refugees, the most often terrorized and oppressed people in the world, uh, helping to get them out of a situation. I think back to a group of refugees, almost 100,000 refugees from Bhutan that had never known anything but the inside of a refugee camp in Nepal. And working with the Prime Minister of Nepal and the King of Bhutan and convincing them after 20 years it was time to let something else happen. And we now have 50,000 Bhutanese refugees in this country who are coming along and will be wonderful citizens. These have been such special things that I've had the opportunity to do. And how on earth does somebody you know, make these kinds of transitions? And I want to tell you a personal story about how an event in your life can so change the direction of your life. And my husband is uh, a first generation American, his mother and father from East and West Germany. We weren't married but a few years when he had never met a lot of his family. And we spent a summer in a country divided by a wall. And I had the first chance in my life to see how differently people behave under two different forms of government. People living in freedom, prosperous, doing really well. People living under communism, oppressed, no prosperity, no progress. It was the first time I had ever even thought about what does the word freedom mean? And it brought me home uh, pretty passionate about making sure that we preserved, did everything that we could to preserve freedom. And it changed the course of my life 
uh, you know, a course to be working not only in this country in every way possible uh, to make sure that we, 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 we contain and, and continue the, the freedom that has made this the great country that it is. So I got into politics. I became a pretty good political organizer. Um, ran for the House of Delegates. Was told women can't win in this district by the Republican chairman in my county. And that was like waving a red flag in front of a bull. And I proved a woman could win. Ran on, went on and ran for governor. Uh, took a big risk because it was highly, uh, obviously, a, a very long shot. Um, didn't quite make it, but found out that when God closes one door, he opens another. Amen. And through life, when God has closed a door for me, he has opened another. And it gave me the opportunity to go on and do something that was the most gratifying thing that I've ever done in my life, which has been working uh, with women throughout the world, with refugees, mostly women and children, uh, providing life-saving assistance, uh, helping to get uh, uh, refugee situations resolved so that they could be resettled and not live the rest of their life in a refugee camp. It's been uh, the best years of my life in, in terms of satisfaction and being able to know that you go to work every day saving lives is about as special as it can get. So I just want to again say a hearty thank you to so many people who have made it possible for me to do the things that I've been able to do and just close with a few observations for uh, young women who might be in this room. Find a thing that you really passionately believe in and pursue it wherever it takes you. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it because you can. Never give up, never give in, be a risk taker, and understand that sometimes you win and sometimes you don't, but if you don't, you pick yourself up and you find another place to put your energies. And my last word of advice is Act like a lady, but work like a horse. <laughs> Thank you for joining us and learning about Ellen Sauerbray. Remember our motto, adding her story to history to tell our story. We want to hear from you. How did you like these stories? Do you have some feedback? Uh, tell us about some women that you'd like to see featured. Share the link with your friends and and tell them about our programs. Let's spread the word. We'll see you next time on Her Story.